She must be very fun to write. I mean, she's her 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 dialogue is great. Her thoughts are great. She's very funny. She's very profound. She's must be fun. There's no there's nothing more fun than to write about a tubercular alcoholic. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> My role here tonight is to introduce our book's editor, Deb Dundas, and our guest, Wayne Johnson. So let me tell you a little bit about Deb. Not only is she, is she our book's editor, but she's a book reporter. And in her own words, she's a lapsed blogger. She's worked full-time at the Star for the past 10 years, and has been reviewing books for us for 15 years. Before coming to the Star, she worked at Canada AM, or uh, Canada AM, correct, as books editor, determining which authors and which books to feature in the program. In addition, she's also been project coordinator for Canada Book Day, where, where she coordinated in the National literary celebration across Canada. Wayne Johnston. Well, as most of you know, he came from a little town. I call it a suburb of St. John's, Newfoundland. And he now lives close to this building in Toronto, which he calls not Newfoundland. Kirkus Review called Wayne, quote, this continent's best writer. But did you know that after he finished getting a BA at Memorial University, he worked for a newspaper? Unlike a lot of us working for newspapers, he saw the light real early and decided to devote himself to full-time writing. His first book, The Story of Bobby O'Malley, was published when he was just 27 and won the W.H. Smith Books in Canada First Novel Award. And subsequent books have consistently received critical praise and increasing public attention. The Divine Lions was adapted to the silver screen, and he wrote the screenplay. Baltimore's Mansion, a memoir dealing with his grandfather, his father, and himself. Won the prestigious Charles Taylor Award for nonfiction. Both The Colony of Un Unrequited Dreams and The Navigator of New York were bestsellers and have been published in the US, Britain, Germany, Holland, China, Spain, and elsewhere. And his new book, First Snow, Last Light, was reviewed in the Star last weekend. Our reviewer said, quote, at its heart, it's a long, a love-hate relationship with the rock. Adding, quote, this is a wondrous book. So tonight, Wayne Johnson will tell us about the rock, about writing, and about this wondrous book. Please welcome Wayne Johnson, Deb Dundas. A lot of people, I think, have been happy to see that Sheila Fielding is making another appearance in a Wayne Johnston book. Yeah, I'm happy that she is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Sheila, for those of you who know uh, uh, Sheila Fielding, she first appeared in The Colony of Unrequited Dreams. Um, and you know, this, this all, is so easy to talk about now, and it all seems, you know, colony has its has its place, and and um, it seems like the mantle of controversy has fallen away. But you know, when Sheila Fielding first appeared, um, the controversy in Newfoundland was was such that I couldn't really go to Newfoundland to promote the book until it came out in paperback. I mean, I could have, uh, but I ch chose not to on the advice of friends who still lived in Newfoundland, <laughs> who helpfully kept me up to date about all the things that were happening in Newfoundland and all the things that were being said. Now, the reason, as if you've read the book, 
is that, you know, Sheila Fielding in the Colony of Unrequited Dreams has an unrequited love affair with Joey Smallwood, which didn't happen in real life, uh, but it does happen in my book. That was, you know, completely platonic. Um, I anticipated that there would be sort of, a, you know, a, a little bit of controversy, um, but I, I had no idea, I, you know, what was coming. Um, the idea, you know, the notion in Newfoundland, you'd have to have uh, grown up in Newfoundland to get this, but the, the idea in Newfoundland for, for a lot of people that Joey Small would, would have had sex any time in his life, <laughs> married, unmarried, whatever, was simply one that you, you, you did not say. You know, you acknowledge that he had children. They were just gifts from God. They were there. <laughs> so even if I had written about Smallwood and Clara, his wife, if I had described a sex scene, which I do in Colony, uh, you know, there would be uh, there would be an uproar, and, and there was a, a tremendous uproar, and I, uh, I didn't go there for a long time, and I finally went at the 50th anniversary of Confederation, um, which seemed like a good time to go. It was a full year since, or more since the book had been out, so I go there, and they reenact the Confederation debates as part of that event. And I'm in the producer's booth, so people don't know I'm there. And the actors who were hired to reenact what was called the National Convention uh, stuck to their lines for the most part at the start. There was the anti-Confederates and the Confederates, and they were actors going back and forth. And we were actually in the National, uh, the, what was called the Colonial Building, where the legislature took place. Legislature was located. And somewhere halfway through, I suppose, their performance, they just started to ad lib. And the character playing Peter Cashin, the independent, started talking to the character playing Smallwood, obviously the Confederate, as if he was actually Smallwood. And it got incredibly intense and personal. And they started screaming at each other and, and, and swearing and everything else. And the producer looked at me while all this was going on and he said, you have a reading in a couple of hours, don't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, what's taking place in between the reading and now? And he said, oh, a, a cocktail party. <laughs> so I said, all of these people will be there, but they'll be drunk essentially. <laughs> And he said, yeah, they might be. He said, they're having dinner as well. So that night uh, was my first reading from Colony. And I read, and people were, no one stopped talking while I read. <laughs> I read, I got through the reading. They said, any questions? Every single person in this place, it was actually called the Colony Club. Every single person stood up. Every hand was up. So I didn't know who to indicate to. And there was this booming voice from the back. It was a professor of theater at Memorial. And he said, um, is there now, or has there ever been in Newfoundland a character like Sheila Fielding who had illicit relations <laughs> with <laughs> Premier Smallwood, a revered Premier Smallwood? And I said, no. I said, there hasn't. And this is something that you could easily figure out for yourself by looking at the cover <laughs> of the book which says a novel <laughs> and i said if you i said if you're still kind of lagging behind look up novel in the oed <laughs> and you will see that it's it, the definition is an extended work of prose fiction fiction i said is that which did not happen that was okay for about three or four seconds and then this guy started in again and eventually he, he walked with a cane. It was almost like Sheila Fielding. Uh, he started coming up a very long middle aisle toward me. And you could hear the thumping of his cane coming up. And he was shouting all the while. And I was thinking to myself, what is his intention? And how could this end well for me? <laughs> the press was there. So either the headline would be, uh, you know, writer 
clobbered by Professor Emeritus from university, or young writer clobbers Professor Emeritus from university. And I, I had no idea what was going to happen. And as he got, he literally got that far, you know, to the, to the edge of the podium. And sitting there, front and center, was the, at that time, mayor of St. John's, who was not a Smallwood fan and loved the book. So as the guy was headed toward me, the mayor stuck out his foot <laughs> and tripped him up. And then he, the professor emeritus, was carried from the room. And all I, last I saw of him was the, sort of the receding soles of his shoes. And it, we, you know, this kind of thing went down. It went down for days later, months later, until finally, when I look back, I think this is how it ended. John Crosby was asked to talk about the book. And Crosby had been a friend of Smallwood's uh, early on in life. He had been a protege of Smallwood's, political protege. He had been a liberal. He then crossed the floor because of a falling out with Smallwood. And so he became what at that time was a progressive conservative. But they, you know, uh, they crossed swords through their entire, what was left of Smallwood's political career, and, and uh, Crosby was then young. So no one knew Smallwood better than Crosby. So they, they had him on CBC radio, and they were asking him about the book. And the, the, the interviewer kept asking the same, book, the same question, basically, which was, you know, but what do you think about this combining of uh, fact and um, fiction and this com combination of history and fiction. Uh, the interview said, do you think this is going to miseducate an entire generation of Newfoundlanders as to what Smallwood's life was actually like? And Crosby said, a long time since I've done Crosby, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, Crosby said, look, this book paints a sympathetic portrait of Joey Smallwood. So it goes without saying that it must be fiction. <laughs> so that emboldened me to bring Fielding back. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I wrote a couple of other books. I brought Fielding back in The Custodian of Paradise. I brought her back again. Um, I, I, I confess to an obsession with Fielding. She um, must be very fun to write. I mean, she's... Her, 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 her dialogue is great. Her thoughts are great. She's very funny. She's very profound. She's must be fun. There's, no, there's nothing more fun than to write about a tubercular alcoholic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's what she is. Uh, it's her writing and her voice uh, that is fun to write. It's extremely difficult to write. Um, especially her, you know, her satire when she is actually a writer in the book, in, in any of the books, when she is writing her field day columns, which she once again does in this book. Uh, that for, for the uninitiated, her field day columns are, she's a, she's a journalist uh, and she writes, a, she's, she's a pundit in, uh, in, in, uh, in Newfoundland newspapers and sort of takes down uh, Politicians and yeah, she others. kind of subverts. The great and the good. Yes, she subverts the um, status quo, mm -hmm. uh, authority figures, uh, and you know which were mostly men. In fact, exclusively men during the era of colony. Um, and to write the kind of satire that she writes, it's completely ironic, and so which means every word she says, she's actually intending the opposite meaning. And not everyone gets that, so you get strange reactions about Fielding sometimes. I can't believe you had Fielding say this. And I said, well, she actually said exactly the opposite. Well, why don't you say that, they said. <laughs> you know. And I said, well, you know, English literature is, is built on irony. I said, read Dickens, you know, read the start of David Copperfield. At the start of David Copperfield, as the woman is pulling away the uh, clothing of David Copperfield's mother, uh, Dickens says that she is a kind-hearted soul who, who will take care of these belongings. What she's actually doing is she's taking the clothes so she can sell them. Right? So this is the way Fielding writes. She writes in a completely ironic kind of way. So you have to go 
go to the uh, opposite meaning. Now, now she's been called, uh, made comparisons to Mother, Mother Newfoundland. Is that apt, do you think? I think, that, you know, that it, in some ways it is, um, because she presides over an entire century uh, of Newfoundland history, and she presides over the century in the very middle of which Newfoundland, the nation, ceased to be. Uh, but she carries with her that, that um, kind of um, bittersweet dream of nationhood, the sense of a lost just cause is what she calls it. Uh, she wouldn't today, if she were alive, be you know one of the 11 members of the Newfoundland Separatist Party. Um, she would, you know, she would see uh, things for what they are, that you have to move on. But, um, you know, her role in life, as she saw it, as, at least as a journalist, was to basically keep people honest and to make sure they remembered what Newfoundland had been and what it might have been. Yeah. Now, that brings up something sort of in this book, but... But before we, we get into that, we should probably <clears throat> sketch a little outline of exactly what the book is about for those who, uh, who don't know. So it's about a family called the Vatchers, mm -hmm. and perhaps you can give us yeah, some time. Yeah, it, it's, it's about a, a family called the Vatchers who live in St. John's. Um, there are kind of two sides to the Vatchers. One side of the family lives on the south side of the city. So if you've ever been to St. John's, you will spend most of your time on the north side and look across the harbor at what's called the brow, the, the hill that separates St. John's from the ocean. So most of the Vatchers are fishermen and, and the wives of fishermen who live on that side of the city. And, you know, the brow was first settled by fishermen. Um, and it was quite a, quite an, it still is quite an extraordinary place. Uh, full of eccentric characters, full of characters who tended to get into trouble. Um, you know, the Newfoundland Constabulary had a, a nickname uh, for the Brow, and I won't tell you the actual family, but in my book I have a counterpart. So they call the Brow uh, the Vatcher Hatchery, because there are so <laughs> many Vatchers, and they so often have reason to deal with them. Because there are so many children, it's also called Mothering Heights. It's, it, it's called all sorts of things like that. So you get a sense of what kind of neighborhood this is. It's working class, it's very poor, uh, but it's full of people who, because they have never been anywhere else unless it's been to go to war, don't really have a sense of how poor they are. Um, and then on the other side of the harbor, there is the other Vatchers, there are the other Vatchers, and that Vatcher family is part of the uh, South Side Vatchers, except that this one member of the family, because he was sort of plucked out of the family and educated at a better school by a Jesuit priest, um, grew up in a very good school, kind of like Smallwood did uh, in Colony of Unrequited Dreams. He, unlike Smallwood, uh, went off to be a Rhodes Scholar. And when he came back, he made a very sort of meteoric rise in the bureaucracy of Newfoundland so that he becomes what is essentially secretary of cabinet. And he brings with him from England a woman to whom he has extolled the wonders of Newfoundland. From London. She's from London. She's from London, yes. Uh, he forgets to tell her about the one or two drawbacks of living in Newfoundland. <laughs> so she wants to go home. That's kind of her dri driving story, aside from her love for her, for her family. She wants to go home. So that Ned Thatcher um, is the, you know, the head bureaucrat during a time when Newfoundland is incredibly poor. So really, he is a big fish in a very small pond. Elsewhere, someone with his salary would have been, at best, lower middle class. And he is a kind of toady to another character from Colony of Unrequited Dreams, who you may remember, Sir Richard Squires. Now, in Colony of Unrequited Dreams, Sir Richard Squires 
was uh, chased out of office by a mob who were literally intent on hanging him because he had mismanaged Newfoundland funds so badly. He had, he had expropriated money for veterans. He had done all kinds of skullduggery things and Smallwood and Fielding save his life in Colony. So he is back as a character and Edgar, uh, who I just mentioned, uh, he has done some things for Sir Richard. We don't know what they are, but they're, you know he has been involved himself in some shady dealings. Megan is his wife, um, and they have a son named Ned. And Ned is based, and we can get into this in a little bit, but Ned is based on a character I almost called by his name, but for reasons I'll get into, I decided, not from the point of view of self-protection, but I decided it was best not to, to base the book entirely upon him. But many parts of Ned's life are drawn from the life of this actual Newfoundlander who only died a, a couple of years ago. Okay. So one of the things about Edgar, this is going, to, going back to the history, is one of the things about Edgar is he was collecting every single book he could get his hands on that had a mention of Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. So he was collecting its history all in, all, all in one, one place. Now, in his attic as a matter of fact. That's right. And throughout the book, without giving away too many spoilers or anything, throughout the book, um, this collection of Newfoundland's history that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger um, moves to various places and uh, bits and pieces get lost and disappear and uh, have holes sort of put, put through it. Um, that's a heck of a metaphor. It is, and, and uh, um, as with Colony and Custodian, First Snow, Last Light is, is, although like any good novel, novels I consider to be good, it's, it's you know, character and plot driven, narrative driven. Uh, there is a level on which you can read this as a, you know, a kind of allegory uh, of Newfoundland. And this, in this case, you would be talking more about the sort of, ultimately, the post-Confederate part uh, of Newfoundland, although a lot of the book takes place um, before Confederation. Edgar begins this collection because he needs an excuse for no longer writing. His wife has this notion that Ed Edgar doesn't subscribe to, that Edgar will be a great writer someday. And he pretends to be writing for years on end when he's actually not. And finally, he works up the nerve to say, you know, Megan, I've decided not to collect, not to be a writer. I'm going to collect books from now on. And she says, well, yeah, that's a lot easier than writing them, you know. And so he collects books. He doesn't just collect books that are about Newfoundland. He collects books in which there is even a, one single mention of Newfoundland. And so he advertises in the New York Times, in the Times Literary Supplement, everywhere around the world for Newfoundland books. And they come to him in hordes. And he stores them in this enormous house they have in St. John's. He stores them on the top of the house. And as Deborah said, this collection kind of has its own legs. It moves from owner to owner throughout the book and has an ultimate end that you will find interesting. Uh, but, but Edgar is, uh, you know, a would-be writer. And when he meets Fielding in the book, he knows from having read her columns and from having been the subject of her columns sometimes that he is meeting a real writer. And he, he's, he's quite taken with her because of that. And that is how Fielding's life intersects with that of the Vatchers. And she eventually becomes ext an extremely close family friend during a time when Ned especially needs a family friend. Um, I'll tell you this much because it's not spoiling the book because it's been in, you know, mentioned in reviews and it's right at the beginning of the book. But Ned, the, the child who is based on the real life figure, uh, comes home from school one day when he's 14 years old. This is, this is the heart, this is the, the sort of core mystery of the book. He comes home from school one day when he's 14 and every day when he usually comes home, his mom is at the window waiting for him. 
This has been happening since he first went to school. It's all the way up now he's in grade nine. It still happens because she treats him you know, like, a, like a baby. She, she loves him so much and she has so little else in her life. This day he comes home and there's no one at the window. It's late November. A snowstorm is about to start. The house is dark. And you might say, well, something came up. But in the life of the Batchers, this would never happen. There, she would, you know, turn hell and high water to make sure that she was there or someone was there when Ned came home. But no one is there. The house is dark. He knocks on the door, he goes and he beats his way inside, he searches every room, no sign of his parents. Life in the house seems to have stopped. There's clothing around, the slippers are arranged just so. Life just seems to have stopped, but no one is home. So he runs and goes to his coach, his track and field coach, who is the Jesuit I mentioned earlier, and that, you know, with that begins the mystery, one of the two mysteries that drive the book. What happened to, they become known as the vanishing Batchers. Because they simply go poof, along with their car, which is an enormous car. Back in 1936, all cars were enormous. And, you know, in 1936 in St. John's, it's very difficult, in fact, as it's demonstrated in the book, it's literally impossible to disappear by running away. The roads that lead from St. John's are primitive at best. With a storm coming on, no one would use them. And they only go you know, a few miles in any direction. So if somebody had a mishap, because for whatever reason they had chosen to simply drive away from their, from their home in St. John's, the car and they would have been found. But there is no sign of the car. There is no sign of them. But so that, that continues throughout the book. One thing I found interesting about that, <clears throat> in particular that, that incident, is that um, Newfoundland itself, the land, becomes a character in the book because it acts on what occurs, what choices the characters make, how, how the plot diverges. Um, you know, the, the idea of land as character in, in Canada isn't... Um, isn't an unknown I, I, idea. How strong is it in Newfoundland literature oh, in particular? It's well, it's very strong in Newfoundland literature, and it's very strong in Newfoundland. But it's, it's so strong, and it's so um, um, universal that it's not necessary to talk about it, um, you know, for Newfoundlanders to talk about it among themselves. And they, they you know, they're, they do, you know, I think Newfoundlanders have a kind of split personality. They have an, an enormous sense of pride, self-pride, uh, totally justified. But they also have, uh, and I, I said this in a, a published lecture, um, they also have a kind of lingering shame for having had to throw themselves, as a lot of the people saw it back then, on the mercy of another country. First, to not be able to handle their own affairs, the country went bankrupt, essentially, and a commission of government came in to run things. And so there is a lingering shame about that. And then the half of the country that joined Confederation, 99% of them had never been to Canada. They, they didn't know, you know, they couldn't have named the capital of Canada. They didn't know anything about Canada. They had a vague notion that it was a kind of socialist state, a godless place, you know, where you didn't have to work to get money, it was just given to you. And, and you know, the idea of throwing oneself at the feet of this country, uh, you know, is something that still carries over to this day. And you still see it in this, you know. Edgar Thatcher is this sort of embodiment of the self-made Newfoundlander until he disappears. And then his son, Ned, he decides that he is going to leave Newfoundland and never come back. He says, I know, he sort of wipes his hands of it. But like a lot of Newfoundlanders who think they've done that, he comes back home again. But he goes on to be what the person his life is actually based on uh, became, 
which is the person who modernized Newfoundland communications, who brought, e even more than Smallwood did, the outside world to Newfoundland by bringing television and modern radio to Newfoundland. So he is the sort of walking embodiment of post-Confederation Newfoundland. It's one of the things I <clears throat> that's a lot of fun about reading your books is looking for um, all the other literary references. So there's references to Shakespeare in here. There's uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Um, there's also um, very prominently throughout the book um, riffs on uh, Eliot's uh, love song of uh, J. Alfred Prufrock. Yeah. So you've got um, you've got uh, Fielding. I think it's saying. Um, in the rooms, this uh, here we are. My glasses. In the rooms, the same men come and go. Their names are Mike and Alan, Joe. They like to think their wives don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, Field, Fielding is, is 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 she riffs on the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T. S. Eliot. You know, in in that poem, a, a famously, unfortunately for Eliot, a, a, a famously anti-woman poem. Uh, because of that line, in, in the rooms the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo is the real line. And the idea is that all of these women know nothing about art, but they, they, they see it as a social event, a way to get together. And it's the men who know about art. So Fielding, as you can imagine, has a lot of fun with that. But as you, if you know Fielding too, you will see that she uses the variations that she makes on that phrase as a way of satirizing the world of men. And so uh, not only that version of it, but she lives in a, you know, a brothel essentially, as she always has. She prefers it because there are all women in it um, and because it's, it's affordable, basically. That's how it starts out anyway. But the, that phrase becomes more and more important to her and more and, and sort of less funny and more and more um, sort of, prof I hope, profound. Uh, you know, um, she's thinking of her own children and the actual father of her own children, who if you've read Colony, and th again, this is not a spoiler, is, is Prowse, who is back in this book as well. Prowse, the school captain uh, of the brother school that she went to, fathered her children, but renounces them privately. No one knows that these kids are his. So Fielding, you know, sometimes when she's using Eliot's phrase, uses it, in, you know, in this way, um, you know, instead of in the rooms the women come and go, it's in the wombs the children come and go, the work of Mike and Al and Joe, you know. And it gets more and more pithy and pointed uh, as the book goes on. I, I, I like doing that, uh, you know, just to sort of uh, create a sense of continuity between feeling as a writer and writers who have come before her. But I also like her to send up those writers, especially if they were men. Now, now with, with the history, I mean, I want to sort of touch on this a, a, a little bit more, more deeply again, is the idea of fact versus versus fiction and how you and how you coordinate the two um, when when you're writing I mean you're you're rewriting history in some ways fictionally how uh, how do you think that has an effect on the way Newfoundland is perceived or what you're adding to Newfoundland's literature does it or does that even matter um, well as, as I as I sort of was uh, saying at the beginning with colony um, you know, if, if you, as long as you keep in mind that fiction and history are being intermingled, you won't be led off into a forest of ignorance about Newfoundland history. At the same time, in Colony, for the very reason that you just asked, I have Sheila Fielding give a history of Newfoundland as she sees it, mm -hmm. right from first settlement by the Europeans <coughs> to present day, and including at the end of Colony, uh, a passage about the passing of the indigenous people 
of Newfoundland. We used to call them the Beothic. They're now called Beothic. Um, but the, you know, the, I, I write about, uh, I, I put Newfoundland history in my books um, in part because it's um, not as well known even to Newfoundlanders as it should be. And it's definitely not as well known to Canadians as it should be. Um, one of the reasons, it's a very practical reason, one of the reasons, and one of the reasons I have Edgar collecting books uh, in, this, in this novel, is that there was an enormous fire in St. John's in 1892, and all of the great Newfoundland book collections, you know, there were tens of thousands of books, most of which, by the way, uh, maybe because they were the, tended to be the only educated people, were either written by ministers of one religion or another, or by judges. And there were tons of histories that are alluded to in other books, but that no longer exist. For Brick Magazine, I once wrote, the, the journal Brick, I once wrote a piece called Lost Classics. And most of Newfoundland's classics were lost in that fire. We still have the names of them, but the books no longer exist, not even one single copy. And so Edgar is hoping when he's canvassing the world, that some of these books may turn up. And you know, the idea is sort of a restoration of a lost story. It doesn't turn out that way because you know, the, the, these books are uh, lost forever. But by writing about um, what is known about the history and filling in plausibly the gaps that are left for practical reasons and for other reasons, often the other reasons can be that, as various people have said, the winners write history. So Newfoundland histories that have been written in the 20th century tend to be highly pro-Confederate versions of how Newfoundland entered Confederation. So if you want the other side, which is not to say the right side, but just the other side, um, you know, my books are, are one way uh, to get it. Now, you know, it's a very local history we're talking about on one level, but the resonance is national and, in fact, international. Um, there was a wonderful article in the Scotsman saying that, uh, saying that no foreign writer is more relevant to Scotland than you, mm. which seems uh, an, interesting, an interesting comparison. Can you, can you talk about that for me? Yeah, that's David Robinson? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I met him in uh, I met him in Olapool in Scotland at a fabulous literary festival. Um, you know, it didn't get dark there till midnight. It was an amazing, sort of otherworldly place. But um, you know, at that time, Scotland was about to have its referendum. You know, should we be independent? Should we continue to be part of uh, England? And it was looking very, very, very close at that time. Uh, as the date drew near, uh, one of the things that tipped the balance was one of the things that tipped the balance in Newfoundland history, in Newfoundland's case, was that people started to think pragmatically. And, and they started to worry, what will happen economically? If they were voting with their hearts alone, if an independent Scotland could be absolutely prosperous, Scotland would be independent today. There's no question about it. That's the case with Newfoundland as well. If Newfoundland had been roaringly uh, prosperous in 1948 when the referenda, there were two of them, uh, were held, I, and I don't say this to dump on Canada or to try to undo history, but there's no way Newfoundlanders would have joined. Uh, because the, one, the half that voted, voted for f pragmatic reasons. Um, particularly the baby bonus, as Small would put it. You know, Newfoundlanders tended to have families of 11, 12, or in cases that I know of personally, up to 22, 23 children. So if you've got a baby bonus, sort of like, you know, per head, uh, wow, you were doing okay. I got 21 <laughs> kids, I'm getting a baby bonus for every baby I have. Uh, and that's, that's how people looked at it. And in, in Scotland, um, you know, they started at the end of the campaign to look at it as well. And David Robinson was fascinated 
with what the fallout of that would be, you know, because I knew what the fallout was for Newfoundland. He said, you know, we'll, because he, he predicted that Scotland would stay. And he said, if, if we make this decision um, based on pragmatic reasons, you know, how will we actually feel? It, it will be nice not to be poor. It will be nice, you know, not to be living from one day to the next. But how, how will we feel in terms of self-pride and, um, you know, self-direction? Uh, how important are those things? And I said, you know, it is a question that will haunt you forever. Um, and that's what I, that's what, you know, that's basically what I tell Newfoundlanders. In Newfoundland's case, Newfoundland is a discrete, separate island, and that multiplies by infinitely the sense of separateness and individuality. Um, and so it's even more difficult, you know, to get over with. I mean, to go from England to Scotland, you only have to drive five feet, you know. Uh, it's not the case with Newfoundland. So, uh, yeah, that's the answer I gave him. Okay. Um, now, the, the, the three books, The Colony, this one, and uh, the other one, um, Custodian of thank you, yeah. um, have been called the Newfoundland Trilogy. Do you agree with that? I mean, it's not been uh, sort of technically what it's been called, but uh, it's what people are... Yeah, I, I have used the term the Colony Trilogy. Uh, not because of the colony of unrequited dream, but just because of the length of time that Newfoundland was a colony and, and how ill-used by the mother country Newfoundland was for so long. Um, so in a sense, this is the third uh, of, a, uh, of a trilogy. This book can be r read without any knowledge of the other two books. Every one of the books, you could read the books in any order, and it wouldn't matter. I recommend one, two, three, uh, but you could read them in any order and it wouldn't matter because each of the books is a, is a separate entity to itself. Um, I, I was tempted to call it the Fielding Trilogy because she is in all three, and Smallwood is only in this book to a very small extent. Uh, other characters, as I mentioned, are, are in it to a greater degree. I learned long ago, in my very first book, there was a character that everyone who read the book, loved. And uh, his name was Ted O'Malley. He was the father of Bobby O'Malley, who is the hero of the story of Bobby O'Malley. And at the end, this is a spoiler, but the book's been out for 30 years, so <laughs> uh, at the end, Ted dies. And I think if I had my time back, I don't know how I would have changed the book. That was the problem at the time. I said to myself, he has to die. It's a, Virginia Woolf was asked, you know, about her books. Why does someone always die in your books? And she said, someone must die so that the rest of us will understand how precious life is. And that was basically why this character had to die in Bobby O'Malley. Um, but all kinds of people said that they love the book, except that Ted died, you know, because a lot of readers don't, you know, they read in the old fashioned way long before postmodernism and metafiction and all those things. They read characters as if they are people. They get to know them as if they are actually people and they feel like they're people. And if you kill one of them, you're, you're, you're the creator of the character and you kill it. It's like, you know, they think it's, it's, it's infanticide. You know, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and so I learned long ago that if I really liked character, um, let's keep them kicking. And so, you know, by the end of Colony, Fielding is 97 years old, but out of those 97, there's at least 70 that are not described in the book. She is off stage far more than she's on stage. Smallwood has center stage. In Custodian, she is on stage, but as you'll learn if you read this book, you need to read Custodian in a particular way to really understand what Fielding is doing. We meant to put it in a foreword that somehow didn't get in. Uh, I'm not gonna spoil it for, uh, uh, for the rest of you. Um, and in this book, she's back, 
So I'm never going to say that fielding is never going to come back. I mean, it could be the tetralogy, <laughs> you know, the colony tetralogy, the colony, you know, de de decology. Decology, sure. I, I don't know how far it goes. <laughs> you know, and Philip Roth has a, a series of Zuckerman books. Zuckerman is a writer, and I think he's been in eight of Roth's books as the major character. John Updike had a character named Beck who he brought in at least five books. Um, maybe because they're writers, uh, writers like to bring them back.